In the second half of Isaiah 7, verse 9, we have the prophet's word to foolish King Ahaz, the physical descendant of David. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. that passage mentions, as we'll see, a key aspect of the subject of the truth, God's truth. To summarize this morning's sermon on God's truth, beloved, we saw that Jehovah is truth in himself, in his attributes, in his being, in his three persons. Therefore, he is truth in his eternal counsel or decree and in the outworking of his eternal purpose in his creation. Tonight, we're going to build upon this and flesh out our picture from the Bible of God's truth. Regarding the biblical idea of truth, we saw that the Old Testament Hebrew word contains the idea of supporting or holding up. And therefore, firmness, stability, constancy, or to speak in ethical terms, of a person, faithfulness, reliableness, and trustworthiness, which calls forth from the heart of the believer the activity of Trusting, relying, believing. And if we move to the New Testament Greek word for truth, one interesting point can be made that's helpful for us here is that it begins with the A privative, the A that often in English is carried over that means not. The truth is not the lie which serves to reinforce the significant statement of 1 John 2, verse 21, no lie is of the truth. No lie is of the truth. Let's look then, with that prefixed, so to speak, at God's truth. God's truth in his revelation, God's truth in his covenant, and God's truth in his people. God's truth. In his revelation, covenant, and people. Beloved, in a sense, everything that God does is revelation. Because in all that he does, he is true to himself. A really good workman puts himself into his work. And you can tell something about his character from that work. Way more so with God. Think of the creation itself. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament or sky showeth forth his handiwork. Which means that the very sky above declares that God is glorious for he made me. Paul expounds that thought, expands that thought in Romans 1 verse 20. The invisible things of God from the creation are clearly seen, being understood through the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In other words, the creation, the creation itself declares 24 hours a day in every language, Psalm 19 explicitly states this, it declares the truth about God, that he is, that he is glorious, that he is eternal and powerful and good, and that he is the creator of the world and the judge of all. Everybody knows this. But ungodly man subverts and holds down the truth in unrighteousness. This message about God 
is not only the message of everything all around us and outside us, it is also the testimony of every human heart, especially in the form of our conscience. Romans 2.15 speaks of this. So that everyone knows, both from without and within, that it is right to give God glory, worship, <coughs> service, and thanks, and that it is sinful to not render these things to him. And these things it is customary to call or refer to as God's general revelation. The matters of creation and providence, God's forming and upholding of the world, and man's very constitution and conscience. And these things are called general revelation because they come to absolutely every man, woman, or child so that nobody can say in the last day, well, I never knew. And so that, to put it differently, everyone is left without excuse because they live in God's world they know it's God's world they reject the revelation of God outside themselves and inside themselves and thereby prove that God is true and every man is a liar now in all the acts of his special revelation God is also true to himself in his saving acts, such as the worldwide flood, the call of Abraham, the exodus from Egypt, and all of the history thereafter of Israel, and especially the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and session of Jesus Christ at God's right hand, swiftly followed a few days after, by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, which led to the gathering of the Catholic or Universal Church through Christ's apostles. All these great saving acts testify of God's truth. And all of these acts are themselves explained by God's words. Usually, God explains the act before it happens, sometimes while it's happening, and even after it happens, so that we're not left with uninterpreted acts, but we are left with explained acts, so that the Bible itself testifies why this is significant, what's really happening here. So we have the words of the prophets, the psalmists, the words of Christ and his apostles, which explain all things and how God is revealed in his mighty acts, that God's truth is manifest thereby. And to take one example, the passage we read, Isaiah chapter 7. There's a prophet here. Isaiah, the events are, the, are these. The southern kingdom of Judah is being attacked by the northern kingdom of Israel or Ephraim, which is confederate with the pagan nation of Syria. This is a judgment of God upon the southern kingdom for covenant breaking. The prophet comes bringing God's prophetic word and engages in some forth telling. He explains the situation to Ahab, and he commands him, Ahaz rather, and he commands him to trust in Jehovah. And along with this forth telling, explaining and commanding, there's even in this passage some foretelling. The northern kingdom and Syria will be destroyed and one day the virgin will conceive and bear a son who is God, God with us. 
of the house of David to the passage indicates. Now today, God's special verbal revelation is recorded for us in the 66 books of the Bible, to which Daniel refers in chapter 10 as the scripture of truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3 declares. Literally, all scripture is God-breathed, such that the words themselves were breathed forth by the Holy Spirit of truth. That leads us to the inerrancy and the infallibility of the Bible. Thy word is true from the beginning. Psalm 119, verse 160. No lie is of the truth. Firm and stable. Remember what we saw from the Old Testament word this morning. Firm and stable are the words of God in the Bible. We also have a completely sufficient Bible. There are no crippling omissions. There are no things that it would have been better had God put them in the Bible. Nothing, absolutely nothing in that category. All the truth that is needed for doctrine and life is either expressly stated in the scriptures or maybe by good and necessary consequence deduced from the scriptures as the Westminster standards well state. And so there's no deficiency in the Bible which then requires additional or supplementary revelation as the Pentecostals would have us believe because then the scripture isn't sufficient truth. God has to add to it. That's where their argument takes them, an attack upon the Bible. Whereas the Bible is true, and with the complete canon, we know that that truth stands firm, unshakable, and complete. God's written word of truth is also a unity. We could say here to paraphrase First John, no contradiction is of the truth. Because all of the 66 books are one in presenting the one truth of God in Jesus Christ. Because once you talk about God's truth, you have to talk about God's truth as set forth in the scriptures. Listen closely to this part of the Westminster Confession regarding the authority of the Bible. Why do we believe it has say so? The authority of the Holy Scripture for which it ought to be believed and obeyed dependeth not on the testimony of any man or church but wholly upon God who is truth itself. <clears throat> the author thereof, and therefore it is to be received because it is the word of God. As God's word, therefore, the holy scriptures are self-authenticating, not needing the testimony of any man or church. To go back to the idea of truth, the Bible stands firm of itself without a denomination or a minister or a believer propping it up and putting stays at the side, otherwise it'll fall over. God's word is true from the beginning, right through, always. And so the church declares, in echoing her master, thy word is truth. Truth unchanged, unchanging, and unchangeable the impregnable rock of Holy Scripture, as one Victorian Prime Minister put it. (coughs) 
all of God's written revelation is true. All the histories, all the doctrines, all the promises, all the prophecies, faithful, sure, steadfast. And therefore, the response of the believer is always trust, repose upon this reliable, faithful word. And we need to add a little bit here about God's truth as propositional revelation. Don't let that phrase put you off. There's an important note here for all of us. What is this propositional revelation? Revelation is God showing himself as he really is. We're back to truth again, of course. And propositional comes from a proposition. A proposition is a statement with a subject and a predicate, a little bit of grammar, but it simply means your ordinary sentence. The first sentence in the Bible will serve us here as an example. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a proposition, a statement, which is true. Other propositions can be False, but we believe in propositional revelation that God makes known his mind and will through sentences, propositions. And this marks biblical Christianity apart from all forms of gross apostasy. Liberalism, classic liberalism will agree. Oh yes, there are propositions or statements in the Bible. The Bible's full of them. But they're not all from God. Some of them are from man. Some of them are from God and man. Very hard to know. It's a human book. So the Bible contains propositions, but not propositional revelation. Or maybe there's some revelation in there amongst the propositions, but it is not prepositional revelation. Neo-Orthodoxy goes at it the other way. God does not reveal himself through propositions, through sentences that convey information. God reveals himself through a mysterious, irrational, existential moment. And so the Bible is used in Revelation. The Bible can become Revelation if God zaps you through it, but it doesn't contain propositional revelation. The Christian view, and it's formulated this way because of the extravagant nonsense of heresy, the Christian view can be summed up in that unfortunate sounding phrase, the Christian view is that the Bible is propositional revel. It contains propositions, statements about God and his salvation and his church and about the world, propositions which reveal Jehovah and his ways. And then we add that it isn't even enough for salvation to have the Bible or even read it. The Holy Spirit is necessary for inner spiritual illumination so that someone receives the truth revealed in the propositions of the Bible, that someone receives them savingly so as to rest and rely on Jesus Christ for all their salvation. This truth about propositional revelation, which is what the Bible is, means that we carefully and prayerfully read the sentences and statements and propositions of the Bible, and in so doing, and through faith, we know God. The God who has revealed himself in humble sentences. Now translated for us into our native tongue of English. Jehovah speaks the truth about himself to us in words, in sentences, on a page. So his people will know him.
So in reading about God's virtue or attribute about, of truth, I was especially struck by an observation of an old English Puritan called Thomas Watson. He's developing in his own inimical way the practical value of God's truth, explaining it. What I found was very interesting, and this is why I'm passing it on to you, is that you can almost see his thinking as he's writing that chapter of his helpful book. He recalls 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, which says that God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so he asks, how does this consist with the truth of God, that God will have all men to be saved, and yet some men perish. Surely God is faithful. He never tells lies. He always reveals his heart and intentions and purposes and desires. And surely God is the God of truth, firm, constant, stable, never fails. How could it be You can see him reasoning in his book. How could it be that God truly, sincerely, really, genuinely wants to save everybody head for head, but doesn't? And his answer is, he recalls Augustine and all the sounder theologians in the history of the church when they've looked at this very verse and says, all men means all sorts of men as the context in 1 Timothy 2, proves, and as the very attribute of God's truth requires. Because God can't really be true and want to save everybody. And not save everybody. And I found this striking, and that's why I related it to you, because this points up the serious error of what's called the well-meant offer because here it impugns God's truth or veracity. And it does that by presenting God as insincere when, according to their theory, God earnestly wants to save everybody by bringing them the knowledge of the truth and yet in the Old Testament... 99% of the world, that is practically everybody outside Old Testament Israel, never even heard the truth of God's word. And so could never be saved. And in the New Testament age, many are ignorant. And if God truly or really wants to save everybody, why didn't he elect them? Why didn't he send Christ to die for them? Why doesn't he regenerate them? Why doesn't he call them? Why doesn't he justify them? Why doesn't he adopt them? Why doesn't he sanctify them? Why doesn't he glorify even one of them? And Remember what we saw this morning, God's truth is God's truth. Infinite, eternal, unchangeable, all-powerful, holy, just, consistent, with no lie of it, always dependable and firm. And that theory, I say, impugns God's veracity. And now we move on to note that the channel in which God reveals his saving truth in Scripture is his gracious covenant. And out of all the 150 Psalms, it is especially Psalm 89 that connects God's covenant and his truth. Psalm 89 verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness or truth to all generations. For I said, verse 2, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness or truth shalt thou establish in the very heavens. And the next verse makes it explicit that it's dealing with covenant faithfulness. 
because it adds, I have made a covenant with my chosen, I have sworn unto David my servant. And there are many other references to God's truth and faithfulness throughout that psalm. Verse 28, to quote one, God says, My mercy will I keep for him, that is David, and prophetically Christ, forevermore. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. My covenant will be truthed. My covenant will stand firm, constant, and stable. And this same covenant of God made by David, made with David, the great psalmist of Israel himself refers to in 2 Samuel 23, God has made an everlasting covenant with me, ordered in all things and sure. Isaiah refers to it. God's covenant contains, quote, the sure or faithful or true mercies of David. This covenant is absolutely certain, you could even say triply sure, because it's a covenant made by the God of truth, because it's a covenant of sure, steadfast, faithful mercies and truth, and because in many places we're told that God swears his covenant in truth. The point of this being that God wants all of his people, from the youngest to the oldest, to be absolutely sure that God is faithful in all the terms and promises of his covenant of grace with his people. And this is the sin of Ahaz. He's a physical descendant of David, with whom this great covenant was made that involved David's descendants sitting upon the throne. <coughs> he is the one who is king over God's church on earth in the Old Testament. And the problem is, he won't believe. Isaiah 7 verse 9. Prophet says to the king, If ye will not believe, and that's a form of the word truth, if you won't rest on this truth, surely you will not be established. Another form of the word truth. You won't be firm. You won't be sure. You will be wavering, weak, vacillating. You'll be destroyed. If you will not believe, my truth and faithful covenant with David, you won't be steadfast. You'll crumble like dust. And he rejected that covenant of God with David, which covenant was established, as verse 14 says, some 700 years future, when Emmanuel, God with us, would be conceived and born. <coughs> Of the virgin. So in the fullness of time then. God in his faithfulness. Sent the Christ of the covenant. In the prologue to John's gospel. He is called the true light. And everything else is darkness. The true light came. Who was full of grace and truth. For the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now it's not saying that there's no grace and there's no truth in the Old Testament. It's a relative, not an absolute contrast. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Ultimately, eternal grace and truth. Permanent grace and truth. Complete, substantial grace and truth. Moses was, as it were, the starters, the main course, the full salvation, as opposed to the temporary, partial, shadowy <coughs> law. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And they could only ultimately come by Jesus Christ because he's God 
and man, the God of truth, must become man to bring grace and truth in their fullness and reality. And likewise, this same Jesus is the truth shadowed forth in the Old Testament types, the laws, the sacrifices, the tabernacle. He brings permanent, ultimate, complete, perfect reality of truth. And that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. The shadows are passing away and the full light of the gospel has dawned. Trust in that reliable revelation, fullness. And don't go back to the shadows of Judaism and the law. And then what happened? What happened with his ministry of truth? He preached truth up and down the land. Well, it brought him to a trial, an ecclesiastical trial where church discipline was perverted. And it brought him to a civil trial before the Roman governor, the representative of the greatest empire the world had ever seen. And some would say it's the greatest empire there's ever been, even to this day. What did Jesus Christ say at his trial? To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And we could add, everyone who is not of the truth doesn't hear Christ's voice. And you remember the skeptical response of Pilate? What is truth? I'm a politician. Truth is something to get votes to speak in 21st terms. But it's not really truth. It's all propaganda and lies. It's unknowable. You're giving me this philosophical religious... I'm a busy man. I don't have time for that. And on the cross, the truth died for elect liars who hated the light before we were, before we were regenerated. The substitute of truth dying for worthless, vain liars bearing our punishment. And unlike Pilate, you must hear the truth of Jesus Christ in your heart. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. And that includes me. I hear it. I believe it. I don't care if the world rejects it. I don't care if I'm laughed at for believing it. But I'm of the truth, and I hear that voice. Because that's the issue. John 3 explains, He that hath received Christ's testimony hath set his seal that God is true. And 1 John 2 asks, Who is a liar? People don't like being called liars. Even liars don't like being called liars. Especially liars don't like being called liars. Because then they're exposed. But who is a liar? Who is the biggest quintessential liar in the world? Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. That's God's perspective on liars. And you can lie about all sorts of things. And that makes you a liar. But essentially, that's a liar. Those who deny Jesus is the Christ. And this covenant Christ of truth brought covenant salvation in truth. And what does Paul in the book of Galatians call the gospel of justification by faith alone? The grace of God whereby we receive righteousness from God on the basis of Christ's obedience to the law and suffering on our account. What is this gospel of justification by faith alone called the truth of the gospel? It is the truth of the gospel. And that's why those who reject it are falling and fallen churches. The truth is stable. The truth holds up. And once you lose the truth, you fall. And we believe this faithful gospel promise. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. To forgive us our sins. 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So how then does God work his truth in the minds and lives of his people? Well, it starts, it starts with regeneration. God plants the incorruptible seed in our heart apart from our will and apart from our knowledge of it even. And then, as a second aspect of the one great work of regeneration, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Born again by means of the word of truth. A truth birth James 1 says and why does God do that well David understood after his great sin of adultery he said thou God desirest truth in the inward parts and since there is no truth in the inward part God has to come in regeneration and put some truth in us by the word of truth and the seed of regeneration and then as those who have been born again who have truth inside them by the Spirit, we believe the truth of the gospel, God's truth in Jesus Christ. We receive it as that which doesn't include in any shape or form any lie, but that which is firm and stable and constant and reliable and faithful and trustworthy, and we lean upon it by God's grace. And it never It never caves in on us. It never collapses under our weight. It always stands firm and strong and true. And this is, in essence, also our assurance of our salvation. The conviction that God is true of himself. He supports and upholds me. And that he supports and upholds me. And therefore, I'm converted, and I'm one of his children. This is how 1 John 5 ends that great epistle. We know there's assurance. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know more assurance that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. And that's referring to Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And if we stay in 1 John a little bit longer, we see also the work of the Spirit of truth in anointing us. 1 John 2, 27, The anointing which ye have received of God abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. There's the assurance of our perseverance unto the very end. And so God then comes to us with his scriptures, places them in our hands and says, Here's my word as a means of sanctification. As Christ prayed and prays for us, sanctify them by thy truth. What truth is that? Ah, thy word is truth. You read the word. You feed on the word. And as we grow in grace, and this is how it all comes together, we become more firm, more stable, more constant. Not up and down, up and down, up and down. And maybe some of us can think back to earlier days in our Christian life and we think that was me, but... I'm beginning to level out a bit more. I'm still going upwards. 
but we're not oscillating so much. Yes, firm, stable, constant, faithful, trustworthy, reliable, because we're becoming, in a very weak, creaturely way, just a little bit more like this communicable attribute of God, like a son, Jesus Christ. We believe in him, we rest in him, and we derive a little bit more stability and constancy so that we can stand up in Christ. And we become like his word, which is faithful and true. We assimilate the word and we become a little bit more like it. Truth. Stable, firm, a little bit less shakable. And this brings us spiritual freedom. Because Jesus taught, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you, what would the world say? An idiot, a moron. It'll hold you back in life. The truth shall make you free. Because the truth is, that when you believe and live lies, you experience bondage in your soul and in your life. And you felt it and you know what I'm talking about. You experience slavery and degradation and shame. But the truth brings liberty. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And this is a freedom, not as the world defines it, you can do whatever you want. You can engage in any sin. And we have the medical methods whereby unwanted pregnancies and sexual diseases and all the rest can be kept to a bare minimum. No. The freedom to serve God from the heart, which is what human life is all about. The freedom to have a good conscience and not feel shame all the time. The freedom from the bondage of the world and the lies of the false church. Paul told Titus at the very start of the canonical epistle, the only canonical epistle to that man, that the truth is according to godliness. And so the believer speaks truth in his heart. He speaks truth to himself in what he thinks. He doesn't think lies. He doesn't think deception. He doesn't feed on that. And then he or she speaks the truth in love to other people. And this involves especially two of the commandments. Thou shalt not bear false witness. The ninth. And the third. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And if you want to see the opposite, instead of this trajectory of firmness and freedom and godliness, well, we have it personified in Ahaz, in Isaiah chapter 7, in his unbelief, and the unbelief of his palace, and the unbelief of his kingdom. Verse 2 when this difficult word came regarding the attack of his enemies, Ahaz's heart was moved and shaken because he didn't have faith. There was no firmness inside him and therefore he crumpled. And the heart of his people, they were moved and shaken as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Think of Ahaz on a windy day in a forest walk. And just watch the trees going, that's him. Because he has no faith, no inner stability. Verse 4, the prophet comes to him and says, contrary to his own unbeliefs, and I'll turn it around, your problem, Ahaz, is that through your unbelief, you're not quiet and calm in your soul. You are fearful. You are faint-hearted. Because that inner stability of faith isn't there. And verse 9 adds, if ye will not believe, Surely, surely you won't be established. You'll be like chaff blown away by the wind. No substance amounting to nothing. 
no firmness, no stability, because no faith. And instead of faith, you see a man filled with hypocrisy. The prophet tells him, ask for a sign, whatever you want, a big, great, humongous sign, anything in the heavens above or in the depths beneath. And Ahaz says, I'm too pious for that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to tempt the Lord. Because he's an actor. He's not speaking truth in his heart and he's not speaking truth out of his heart. He's a hypocrite and false to the core. And you don't want to be like Ahaz in the visible church. Because what is apostasy? How is it defined in the context of the great apostasy of the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? It is not receiving the love of the truth. If you don't love the truth, then you are set up for apostasy because something will happen, some test, some trial, something will crop up in the church or in your life and you don't love the truth and you'll go into the world or the false church. That is another form of the world with just enough religion to salve your conscience. Most of the time. or Some of the time. And those who do not receive the love of the truth, end up, says that same passage, believing a lie that they might all be damned. And Revelation teaches us that outside the gates of the kingdom of heaven are found all liars. And whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. In the growth of each and every Christian, in God's truth, we need Christ's church, a true church, a church, to use biblical language, which is a city of truth, which is a faithful city, a church which is filled with believing men and women and children who are all convicted of the truth. They're convicted of the truth as truth. This is biblical. This is right. I've seen it. I'm sticking with this. This isn't my favorite shopping mall or grocery shop. This is truth. This is a church which teaches the truth. I'm convicted of that. A church in which the members are reliable and solid and stable and constant people. Not because they're some sort of super people, but because in their heart they believe. And faith is a matter of the heart which gives inner certitude, stability, and constancy. It is a city, the true church, in which everyone is engaged in a very honest trade. They're buying the truth and they're selling it not. It is a city in which everyone worships the God of truth. And they worship him, as Jesus says, he can only be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Such a church is what the Apostle Paul was referring to in 1 Timothy 3 as a pillar and ground of the truth, which disseminates the word of God near and far by all lawful means to the best of its ability. And the church does this especially through preaching, rightly dividing the word of truth, so that Jesus Christ himself, the truth of God, speaks, and everyone who is of the truth hears his voice. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, give us a love and a hunger for thy truth. Increase our faith that we may be grounded and rooted and settled in the truth and that we may be firm and that we may stand in an evil day. For we ask this in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.